When learning any creative craft, it's always important to diversify the different places that you are learning from. Of course, it's important to learn from experience. It's important to learn via things like video and podcasts. But another thing that one should learn from, books. So today we are going to be talking about writing better lyrics by Pat Pattinson. I'm going to go through three tips that I think were important takeaways from this book. I've read through it several times. It's super helpful. Let's talk about it. Hello, friend. Welcome to another episode of the Songwriter Theory Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joseph Vidala. And today we are doing, for the first time, a dive into a book a little bit. But of course, we're not going to be able to make our way through an entire book, but uh, which you can tell has been read a lot based on <laughs> how bendy it is. But um, unless you're on audio, then you cannot tell. But then you're going to have to take my word for it. So, um, so today we're specifically going to be talking about lyrics and three lyric tips that have been a big impact to me that I got from this book. And of course, I'm going to encourage you to get this book as well. I'll put a link in the description to the book in the YouTube video and probably in the podcast as well. If you are interested, if I remember correctly, it's like 15 bucks or something like that. It might be a little more. Um, don't hunt me down if it is a little more because... It's just what I think I remember. It's been a while since I actually bought this book. I've read it multiple times since buying it. It's actually the first songwriting book I, I bought, and uh, it inspired me to, to buy more. I have more now because this is actually pretty good. So first thing, perspectives matter. So the first thing I learned from this book is that your songwriting point of view is something that's actually fairly important and impactful. And if you remember correctly, or if you remember, I guess, a while back, I actually did a bunch of episodes on each point of view. And that's actually inspired by this book. This book goes through the different points of view and some of their strengths and weaknesses. So I thought to myself, oh, that's a good piece of content to do. That's a good thing to teach all of you are the different points of view. So we're not going to dive deep into that today. You can always go back on YouTube if you're on YouTube or in the podcast if you want to check those out because I do a deep dive into each of the four. They're each their own podcast episode, but from a very <coughs> high top level, you had direct address. Um, direct address is basically you having a conversation with somebody, right? This right here is direct address. It's me, I, I'm in the story talking to you. And it's generally the most intimate point of view. This is the point of view that you're probably going to be using most often. It's probably the most common songwriting point of view. Pretty much every love song fits into this, right? Like, you broke my heart, right? The you in the song is is the person on the other side listening to the song. It's not really, obviously. Um, it's whoever the person was. But um, that's sort of how the direct address works, where you can kind of put yourself in the shoes of the you of the story, as the listener. And then this first person point of view where there's no you, uh, there's only an I and then a he, she, they. So this is sort of like, um, you know, tell, telling your spouse about some, some story about you and your high school friends back in the day or something, right? Because there's an I in the story, you know, me and my friends did this, but I'm recounting it to my wife and you know, she, I'm telling her the story, but she's not actually in the story. And that's what first port person point of view is, which is certainly one that we can take advantage of in the context of songwriting. Second person, probably the most rare. Uh, there's no distinct I in second person. So it usually is something where the narrator is either talking to someone that's that's in the world of the song, but the narrator is outside of that world, or probably more more commonly is sort of the the man looking in the mirror type concept of you know you're talking to yourself um, would be the other main way that second person is used. Third person, there's no I, it's just he, she, they, right? So you're functioning as a narrator that's outside of of the the world, right? So you know, for example, in a movie, if the narrator is implied to be sort of this godlike, all knowing narrator that's narrating this story that's outside of their world, right? So, you know, for example, if, if it's somebody reading from a book, right? In that case, you're a third person narrator because you're not in that story. You're just telling the story. 
That's what third person is. This tends to be the least intimate point of view, but it's also the most objective point of view. So going through those four points of view, this book takes a deep dive into all four and the the strengths and weaknesses of them, how to do them. Um, and that was something that I found super helpful because honestly, I had taken points of view for granted before I read the book for the first time. Um, and, and it changed my mind sort of about it where before it just was something I just hadn't thought of. I just wrote songs, um, and didn't really think about point of view much. I think most of us tend to just default to, um, specifically direct address for the most part, sometimes third person, but that is the tip number one I have from this book is just taking into account the different perspectives that you can tell your song from. They each have their different strengths, but you know, for again, if you want to take a deep dive into this, either A, get the book, or B, or or you could do both, obviously. B, go check out the podcast I did where I took a deep dive into each of these. Also, they are YouTube videos as well if you are on YouTube. Um, but the main thing to take away from this is for right now, just know, think through like, okay, what, what point of view do I tend to do? And what are some different points of view that I can try that just functions as a, as a different way of telling a story. Specifically, I would say if you've mostly done direct address, I would encourage you to try third person. I think that's probably the second easiest to do and the most radically different in some ways, uh, considering that one is extraordinarily intimate and the other one is like you, you being a, a narrator that's in theory unbiased in the story. Tip number two is <clears throat> probably the number one takeaway from this book. Uh, so if you've read this book or if you've heard of Pat Pattinson before, this is probably the number one thing that he's known for, and that is object writing. And specifically, I want to talk here about the power of object writing. I think I've talked about object writing before in during the podcast, but for for today's episode's purposes, to me, the main underlying takeaway is a lot of us think through practicing as something that you do for skills, right? So to get better at a skill, we have to practice that skill. And I think as songwriters, it's easy to be like, oh, our skill is, you know, our instrument. So I might work on my voice. I might work on my piano skills, my guitar skills. You know, I do scales and, and practice improvisation and stuff like that. But I think what sometimes we might neglect doing is the idea of practicing songwriting and specifically in this case, practicing lyric writing or at least practicing deep diving into our emotions, which is sort of what lyric writing ends up being, right? Lyric writing, it, it should be a visceral, emotional type thing because nobody wants bland lyrics that feel lifeless. They should feel real and like they were taken out of the center of our heart, right? That's sort of what makes something moving is feeling that 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 real uh, just that realness, which usually only comes from something that's very genuine from the heart. So what object writing does is it sort of teaches you to do that and to do it more quickly and more well. So if you don't know what it is, the brief version is basically his specific recommendation is taking 10 minutes in the morning and and exactly 10 minutes, not more than 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes, like set a timer and you pick an object. So say camera, right? I'm looking at a camera right now. Take that and then you deep dive talking about the camera and you can go anywhere with this. You don't have to stay on the camera for 10 minutes, but you utilize all your different emotions or sorry, all your different senses, not emotions. So like, you know, your five main senses, hearing, smell, taste, touch, sight. Uh, but also organic, which is like heartbeat, right? Or, or, or feeling the sweat come or, or you know, pulse mu muscle tension. Uh, and kinesthetic sense, which is sort of the, your sense in relation to the world, right? Is the, is the room spinning because you have vertigo or is the room spinning because, you know, you get seasick. If you're anything like me, I get sick like a dog with, with ocean stuff. Um, it's one time I went deep sea fishing, one and only time, uh, on a hundred foot boat, which is... Decent size, right? A hundred foot boat's not not small. It's probably even bigger than that. And my dad joke always jokes like it is like it was the calmest day of the the ocean he's ever seen. And he's not wrong. It was remarkably calm. And I literally passed out. <laughs> so deep sea fishing was not a fun experience for me. Anyway, <laughs> not the main point of this story, but uh, just as an FYI, 
get super seasick. I know that's super useful information for, for you. Um, you'll keep that in mind for the future because it's so important, right? I hear you shaking your head. That's okay. That's okay. You're right. That was completely unnecessary information. So, so anyway, he advises 10 minutes in the morning, you just write, utilizing your senses. Again, it's all sensory driven. You know, how, how does, how does it make you feel? What are you, what are you hearing? Do you, do you hear the, you know, say the, the camera still has film in it. Like, do you hear the, the, the film as it, as it rolls through? Do you, well, and you're, and, and you're talking about what you see and what you feel. And the idea of it is you want to be able to more quickly dive into your senses and, and just dive into, you know, deeper writing more quickly. And that's sort of what object writing is meant to train you to do. Now, full disclosure, I've done the specific brand of object writing that that he talks about um, c- certainly many times, but it's not really something that I commit to doing every single day. For me personally, it's something that I sort of made my own brand of off of it. So specifically for me, what I utilize it for, if you've ever uh, checked out my six steps lyric writing checklist. In that checklist, I talk about the brainstorm sheet. And in the brainstorm sheet, often what I do at the top, besides the images, so I get the Google images, which if you don't know, I'm talking about free guide, link in the description. It's a songwritertheory.com slash lyric checklist. Um, And it takes you through my six steps that I go through for developing a lyric because it's not one step. You don't just write the lyric and it's good and it's fine. You don't just keep writing lyrics at like with no rhyme or reason behind it until you have something decent. Like there's six steps that you can, that you can do that will make it so much easier, more effective and make each step have less pressure. So check that out if you're interested. But so in my brainstorm sheet, I have, I get grab Google images, um, that help sort of keep keep that inspiration and have something to, to look at to give me some visceral feelings to write off of. And another thing I usually do at the top is not exactly object writing. Sometimes it's more exactly object writing, but it's more just, just I write for 10 minutes or more without being judgmental about it or anything. And I'm not even trying to write lyrics, right? So this object writing thing, you're not trying to write lyrics. You are just writing what you feel and think in paragraph form. So that's exactly what I do to help sort of work out some of the the inner associations I have and feelings I have and senses I have towards whatever it is that I think the song is going to be about. And a lot of times it gives me a lot of stuff to pull from when I'm actually writing the actual lyrics. Sometimes I'll come up with, you know, certain words and 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 really good verbs that I use that I'm like, oh, yeah, that that's exactly the verb I need in this song. And it gives me words that I can pull from. It gives me emotions I can pull from. Which is another beauty of object writing or your own version of object writing, which is the idea that you, you can you can take what you've done, right? Which is an exercise primarily. The primary, the primary, primary, well, I can't, that's not how you say the word, primary. The primary goal of it, right, is, is like scales. When you practice scales on the piano or guitar, right? You're not really trying to, do anything productive outside of you are working on your skill. And that's true of object writing as well. But the beauty of object writing is it also could be something that actually leads to something. It's it's almost more like improvisation, but this is improvisation of words. So I've talked many times that I think improv, improvisation, uh, using an instrument is like the heart of songwriting. It's how songwriting starts, right? A lot of times how I start writing songs is I just improvise at the piano for like an hour and maybe I come up with three or four different piano riffs that I really like and those are the starts of songs. Object writing can be the same thing, but for lyrics. So anyway, that is literally the first chapter of this book. Good stuff. Uh, you can also check out, I think he has a whole website about it that even has a 10 minute timer. If I remember correctly, that's tip number two, object writing. Tip number three, the role of meter in lyrics and sort of how it can play with the listener's expectations. So a lot of songs and a lot of things tend to be in common meter. And meter is something that I think is a great example of something that applies to both lyrics and poetry, 
because lyrics really should be poetry, right? And you can even say that it is poetry, whether it's good poetry or not is a different discussion. And regardless, though, your average songwriter, to me at least, it seems, don't fancy themselves as poets, which I think is you're missing out if you're not. So if you don't think of yourself as a poet, you should start because really a great songwriter is going to be a hybrid of a really good poet and a really good music composer, right? And the tendency as a songwriter can get away with being more average at both of those things. But I would challenge you if, you, if you become really good or great at both of those things, your songwriting is just going to skyrocket because those are the two primary skills. But um, that aside, something that poets think about more that I think sometimes we as lyricists, it's easy to kind of just like put words that go to music, which is fine. That's a good start. But leveling up how we are specifically as lyricists, as poets, is something very important. So common meter, if you don't know what it is, is basically the idea of four stresses followed by three stresses and then four stresses and, the, and then three stresses again. So for example, I hitched to Tulsa worn and soaked. I, I hitched to Tulsa worn and soaked. That's a four. Stopped to get a bite. The waitress started before she spoke, then asked me what I'd like. Then asked me what I like. I butchered that, <laughs> but the point is that it has a certain rhythm to it so that by the time that fourth line comes, you know more or less what to expect. So because I butchered it, you probably are like, that doesn't sound right. Let me try again. I hitched to Tulsa, worn and soaked. I stopped to take a bite. The, w the waitress stared before she spoke, then asked me what I'd like, right? That, that just sounds right. And that literally is just Four, three, four, three. You're setting a pattern with the first two, right? Four followed by three. And then you hear four again. So now you, you are implicitly expecting a three. And that's what common meter is. So starting with common meter and actually thinking through those things, you know, where are the stresses? And the stresses are really just the emphases, right? Where in these words are, is the natural emphasis? Because every word has natural emphases. Right? Like my name is Joseph, not Joseph, right? That's literally just a difference of stress, right? This, the stress is on the Joe, unfortunately, because then some people just call me Joe, which is not my favorite, would be an understatement. So um, my eyes glaze over when somebody calls me Joe. You know what my favorite thing is? Another small aside here, but don't be that person. And, and you might know this person too. If you're like me and you want to be called specifically something, but people like specifically, people want to shorten your name, it's the most frustrating thing ever, right? The amount of times where like there will be an introduction and I'll say like, hi, I'm Joseph. And they'll say, oh, hey, Joe. Like, okay, I literally just introduced myself as Joseph. And then you just, just assumed that I go by Joe. Why would you assume that? I introduced myself as Joseph. Or I signed my email as Joseph. Why would you assume that I go by Joe? Major pet peeve. Dr drop a like on this video if you're there. Or drop a comment down below if you are like me and you've gone through this. You want to go by your full name. Maybe your name's like Nicholas or something. And you don't like going by Nick. But people just insist on calling you that. Whatever your scenario is. Let me know in the comments. But anyway, let's wrap this up. So... Uh, common meter is a good thing to start with, which is just four emphases, three, four, three. Um, but you can also play with that. And, and this book really dives into the different ways that you can play with that and the different effects. We don't have time to go through all that. It's a whole chapter in this book. So obviously it's not something we can cover in the last couple minutes of this episode. But uh, an example is he changed up the lyrics. So, so the lyric I just read is directly from the book. Uh, so a change up would be, I hitched to Tulsa worn and soaked, stopped to get a bite. The waitress stared before she spoke. I felt the vibe. So now that last one went down to two stresses. So it sounds off, right? So in context, it almost catches you off guard and, and gets your attention a little bit. And you can use that in your song lyrics on purpose to get that effect. Right. Another example would be making that that fourth one instead of another three. You actually up it to four. I hitched to Tulsa, worn and soaked, stopped to get a bite. The waitress stared before she spoke, then smiled and asked me what I'd like. 
So again, just has a different feel. And in the book, he really gets into how that can be paired with, with rhyming and, and just is a deeper dive. So again, I encourage you to get the book. Link will be in the description if you are interested. Really good book. Um, certainly highly recommend it. And, and I'm pretty picky about lyric stuff. And, and th- so it's a little rare for me to feel like I, there's really nothing I saw in this book where I'm like, ah, nah. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's really solid and it's not, um, pretentious. So I think that's something where I feel like the music world is one of two things. And I, I try to be right in the middle and uh, let me know if you think I do a good job at that or not, I guess. But, uh, I find that a lot of times there's people who are like so pretentious off in classical jazz world. And they say like any music that's not classical or jazz isn't like real music. And, you know, if we're not talking about a flat minor 11th chords and, 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 you know, like anytime they hear C major chord, they're just like, Oh, boring, horrible. Never do it ever. It's not even real music. Right. So you got the really pretentious crowd, um, which for the record, I think there's tons to learn from that side of things. As you know, I'm a big believer in music theory and it's very important, but which is sort of the point I'm getting at. And then there's the other side, right? Which is like, oh, just like put out a chord progression, like pick up a chord progression from the internet, like one, five, six, four, you'll be good. Just like sing stuff and it feels right, you're good. And like songwriting's easy. You don't you don't have to like learn any music theory. You don't have to like learn the language of the thing that you write in, like, right? Like, I don't know Spanish and I write books in Spanish all the time, right? Like th- that's not how it works. So, so learn some music theory. I also have a free guide on that, by the way, for the four pillars that you should learn. But anyway, hope this was helpful to you. If it was and you're on YouTube, be sure to drop a like. It helps me out with the YouTube algorithm, helps more people find this content. And if you've been a podcast listener for a long time and you haven't yet, I don't know the exact number of people who have left reviews on iTunes, but I know that the number difference between the amount of people who listen every single week based on even last I checked on the stats, which was like months ago and months ago, it was way higher talking like times 300 or times five times crazy numbers based on how many people have left reviews on iTunes. So if you're one of those people, many, many people I'm talking about and you've thought to yourself, man, I've gotten a lot of, you know, hopefully good stuff from this podcast. I listen every week or some of you have been, have emailed me about like, Hey, I just found your podcast and I'm starting from podcast one and now I'm on episode whatever. And I'm trying to catch up. So if you're any of those people, and you've gotten, you know, a, a lot of helpful stuff from this. My one ask, the one ask, leave an iTunes review, specifically if you feel like you can give it like five stars, hopefully, or at least four stars. If you don't think it's worth four stars, then first of all, why are you even listening to this podcast? Um, I don't think I would listen to a podcast I would give three stars to. Um, I don't, four is like the minimum. But anyway, it helps me out. It helped because it will allow other people to see, hey, this podcast is helpful, and then there will be more listeners. And then the more listeners there are, the eventually, hopefully, I can spend more time on this and 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 even up the content. Uh, obviously, it's come a ways already. I used to do one podcast and one blog post per week. Now we are up to one podcast and then like two other videos per week on most weeks. Some d- weeks it's just one extra video, but. Uh, my goal eventually is to really get to like three videos every single week. Um, but I need to be able to spend more time on it. Best way for you to help me get there is to tell people the good news of this show. And a great way to do that is just leaving a kind review on iTunes. So if you haven't done that, that's my plea to you all. Thank you for listening again. Link in the description for the free guide, which is my six steps that I go through. When I'm writing a lyric, it is super, 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 super helpful. I've said this in some private emails. It's my personal favorite of the free guides I have um, because it's so... um, Lyrics are just so often abandoned or taken for granted, and they shouldn't be. And this, these six steps just help make it much easier to get good lyrics out there. 
Um, so I love this guide. Be sure to grab it. Songwritertheory.com slash lyric checklist. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I will talk to you next time.